Hello, and welcome. I'm John Dansley, Director of International Media Studies at Brigham Young University. In July of 2001, three journalists in Colombia were killed by unidentified gunmen in one week. In the last 10 years, 34 Colombian journalists have been killed, often by cold-blooded murder. Also in 2001, a radio journalist in Costa Rica was assassinated outside his home. A Cuban journalist was sentenced to two years in jail for distributing so-called false information, and a bomb destroyed the offices of Caracol Radio in Medellin, Colombia. The killings, bombings, and imprisonment are part of the fabric of journalism in Latin America. It's an area of the world that is increasingly turning to democracy as a way of government. But new freedoms in Latin America often don't extend to the press. In most countries in the region, reporters and editors still labor under laws and restrictions that limit their rights to find out the truth and report it. The Latin American press is still struggling for freedom. Today, we've brought together a panel of experts to discuss the situation of the press in Central and South America and the Caribbean. Our guests include Juan Vasquez, world editor of the Miami Herald and former Latin American correspondent for CBS News. While working for CBS News in 1988, he won the Maria Moores Cabot Award from Columbia University for outstanding foreign reporting in Latin America. At the Miami Herald, Juan Vasquez is responsible for the paper's Latin America coverage. Karen DeYoung, associate editor of the Washington Post. Before becoming an editor, Ms. DeYoung reported from Nicaragua during the Contra Revolution and the, from El Salvador during the war there. Her reporting also won her the Maria Moore's Cabot Award for promoting inter-American understanding and the Sigma Delta Chi Distinguished Service Award for foreign reporting. Rosenthal Calmon Alves, Knight Professor of International Journalism at the University of Texas. Before beginning his academic career in the United States, Professor Alves spent 27 years as a professional journalist in his native Brazil. He was foreign correspondent, and later managing editor and member of the board of directors of Jornal do Brasil in Rio de Janeiro. One of his areas of teaching and research at the University of Texas emphasizes the struggle for a free press in Latin America. Our program today is being taped before an audience of students and invited guests in the studios of KBYU-TV on the campus of Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. Karen, let's begin with you, and then I'd like all of you to join in. You've all reported from uh, Latin America. Let, let's start with some war stories. Uh, tell me about the worst case of censorship or intimidation that you experienced there. Uh, I, not censorship so much. Uh, I think that foreign correspondents, particularly American and European correspondents in Latin America, you, you don't get censored. I mean, you, you uh, sometimes might get expelled um, in the past if you... That if ever you, happened to you? No, it didn't. Mm -hmm. um, but um, you certainly get intimidated from time to time. And, and in my case, that would have been uh, most often in um, the southern cone countries, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, uh, Uruguay, during the late 1970s when all of them, as most of Latin America, were ruled by military governments. And, and what form did that intimidation take? Oh, you were followed. Uh, you were frequently called in uh, to um, big rooms with lots of men with uniforms and they would have spread out on the table before them various things that you'd written and they'd, it would be marked up with red pen and they'd very sternly look at you and say, what, you know, who told you this? Why, why did you say this? What is this all about? How do you know this? Um, and, you know, for somebody who certainly was, was my age at the time, it, it was quite intimidating. And how old were you? You were in your early 20s at the time. I was in my early 20s, yeah. yeah. And you speak Spanish, right? So mm -hmm. you, were, you were doing all this in Spanish, right? Mm -hmm. Other times, I, I had, uh, I was the staff correspondent for the Washington Post in the region. I had stringers in other places. And they were uh, in a lot more danger than I was. Uh, and I remember the first time I went to Chile, uh, and this would have been in 1977, I had a stringer there who was an American, but someone who lived there, had a family there. Um, he was being expelled from the country, and I went to the presidential palace and in a very demanding sort of way, demanded to speak to whoever was in charge of the journalists and said uh, this was an outrage and how could this happen, and my newspaper was very upset. And a man, also in a uniform, looked at me and said, um, you don't know very much about this country, do you? How do you? What do you know about this man? Do you know who his friends are? 
Do you know who he spends time with? Do you know where he gets information? And the whole implication being that I, I was somehow promoting some level of And that you were naive. And you that are. I was naive, yeah. Yeah. And, and when you would be called in to one of these rooms and questioned by generals and people in uniforms, what was the threat? Was there a threat to your physical safety or simply that you oh, had to be It was an implied threat. It was never, oh no, these people were much too, um, I was going to say sophisticated, but that's not really the word I mean. Uh, they, were, they were too intelligent, I think, in this context to, to threaten directly. The, the, it, it was always a, more of a, um, you don't understand. Mm -hmm. We know things that you don't know. And, um, and, and always the implied threat of expulsion, and sometimes that was a specific threat, but uh, that usually didn't, didn't happen. One, what about you and your experiences in Latin America? Well, I would agree that <clears throat> there was in intimidation, and you would be called in. And in my case, I remember uh, in El Salvador being called in before the uh, defense minister and being told that we understand you have written this and you have said that. And, and again, as Karen said, it was very, I was told very explicitly, you don't understand. You don't know what's going on here. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, you must, yeah. yes, um, and you must watch yourself. And I said, what does that mean? <clears throat> Are you saying, they, they, they would have a code word for saying your life is in danger by saying we cannot guarantee your safety. Right. And I said, are you saying that you cannot guarantee my safety? And he said, oh, no, 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 no. We're not saying that. <laughs> not yet. Oh, really? Not yet, huh? Um, what about in Brazil? Was well, in my case, I had both. I had my, my experience as a Brazilian in Brazil and as a foreign correspondent in those countries. I've covered uh, Central America and South America. As a Brazilian in my own country, uh, the uh, censorship was, was uh, officialized. I mean, was, was, was official and open when I... It started as a reporter in the end of the 60s, and we had a military di dictatorship, and it was very common for me in a radio station to re receive orders from the, from the censors that we don't want any story about this or about, about that, wh which uh, was interesting because in some, sometimes it was a way for, for me to learn about things that mm -hmm. were going on in the, in, in, in the country, like a guerrilla movement in the in the Amazon area of, of Brazil that I had no I idea, but when they say, one day they, they even censored a story that someone from Reuters would write. I mean, they, you cannot publish anything that, that this man is going to write in Montevideo, Uruguay, which is, was amazing because it was a censorship of something that was not written yet. Uh, as a foreign corres correspondent for Jornal do Brasil, I, I suffered the same kind of things especially in the southern cone uh, in Argentina, Uruguay, and Paraguay uh, during the military di the dictatorship was followed. In, in, in Uruguay, it was very common that I was followed. They went to m One day, I just asked the guy if he wanted to have a cup of coffee with me because he's been following me for, following <laughs> me for two days. And I said, why, why don't you just join me here and have a cup of Who Who are you? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, uh, even as a Brazilian correspondent, is, is, there, there is a difference be, between the kind of threats and intimidation that a local uh, journalist receives than, than we as, as, as foreigners. Explain. Uh, because uh, usually we, we come and go. I mean, uh, I mean, I was based in Buenos Aires covering all the southern cone. So when I go to uh, when I went to Paraguay in the during the Stroessner dictatorship, for instance, always they had my passport with a little uh, was different from from the other passengers of this plane. I I go there, they know where I am, they f kind of follow me. My newspaper was censored, whatever you know, like the newsstand person would would would, would say. Senor Rosenthal, you're, you're here. You know that Journal of Brazil is not here today. <laughs> I mean, that, that was kind of systematic. But I, I go there and I, I come back, and, and the journalists are st uh, keep there. I mean, they, they are still there. And besides, there is this thing that, uh, uh, th that is not uh, real now in foreign in war correspondence, for instance, that we were kind of 
protected by the fact that we were, were foreigners and our government just would uh, uh, take care of us. And this kind of protection dis, uh, didn't exist for the locals. How did, how did you deal <coughs> with this sort of intimidation when, when it came? Did it make you frightened? Did it change the way you reported? Um, what effect did it have? I, I would like to think that it didn't change the way I reported. I don't, I don't think it did. Was I frightened? Yeah, sometimes. Um, you know, you were living, I, I lived by myself. Um, I worked by myself most of the time. Um, you had uh, an embassy uh, that from country to country was either helpful and sympathetic or uh, hostile and unhelpful depending on what, a lot of times depending on the personalities involved uh, of, of people who were in your own embassy. Um, and, and, and mostly, in my experience, too, in this part of the world, um, the, the American embassy was not particularly helpful most of the time. And you usually kind of steered Why steered was that? Clear was that because you were rocking the boat? Well, you remember, again, um, to go back to the, to the time in, in the late 70s, um, you had uh, um, military governments. You had a, uh, a liberal president in this country who wanted to change the relationship with mm -hmm. those governments and put an emphasis on human rights. Uh, and so because, to a certain extent, we follow the agenda of the U.S. government in terms of what we choose to write about, human rights was a big thing for us right. to write about. Right. That was a, precisely what they didn't want us to write about. Mm -hmm. um, after the Carter administration, then you had a situation where some of these governments felt they had a sympathetic presence um, in Washington. And certainly, that was the case in, in um, in El Salvador, uh, where uh, you really, uh, they really did not want you to report certain things, yeah. and there were people who were sent to the to those embassies, um, who how shall I put it, were um, economical with the truth, as we used to say <laughs> in Britain, <laughs> uh, who 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 did not saw it as part of their job to make sure that certain things were not written. Um, in a certain way, but but to go back to what what Juan said, this th that great that great phrase of we cannot guarantee your safety. That is that is the sort of classic, <coughs> and you you hear that even now. I yes. mean, you hear it, and you certainly heard it in El, El Salvador mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. a lot during is, that period. Is the situation better now than it was <coughs> when you were reporting? Well, I think the situation is a lot better because I think the governments uh, they they no longer have that. In El Salvador, there was a civil war going on. People were getting killed. Uh, lots of people were getting killed. Bodies were literally, the, f the first thing you did in the morning was go out and see how many bodies you could find laying around the street. And the political officer at the U.S. Embassy had a job of, of keeping count of how many people were getting killed. That creates an atmosphere where uh, they, they forget, they might forget to say, oh, this person's a journalist, he's an outsider, he's a foreigner. Um, or, or, you know, these people over here are journalists. They're not really participants in a war, so we, we, they're really innocent. We can't attack them. There's a war mentality. There's a bloodlust that really is created. That's not going on in a lot of places now, except Colombia, as you mentioned at the beginning. And I think that contributes to it because the stakes are really life and death. Yeah, I think in in, in El Salvador, for instance, we we were very. Um, confident that we, if we put uh, TV, the two letters in our cars and we go to war zone, they would not target us <coughs> at least. I mean, that, th that's some, something that in the, in the chaotic situation of Colombia, for instance, now we are not sure if we put TV, maybe they, they target you. Yeah, they <laughs> image you like they did in Bosnia and, and other uh, parts of the world uh, in the post-Cold War era where this non combatant uh, uh, status of journalists are not recognized anymore. So it's, it's pretty chaotic now in this, uh, in this sense. What's the, most, uh, what's the most dangerous place to work in Latin America today? Colombia. 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 <laughs> Said as with one voice. Why Colombia? I think because it's, there, there are, uh, there is a climate of lawlessness, uh, if you will, throughout virtually all of the country. Uh, the, the country is at war, and the, uh, there are 
several different levels of combatants fighting over a number of different things. Uh, and in order to find out what's happening, uh, obviously this is a place of great interest for, for the United States. And so if you work for a United States media outlet, then you're going to go try to see where U.S. money is being spent, uh, what the troops are doing with the training they're getting from the United States. And that requires you to go into the places where people are shooting at each other. But there's an addif additional level from the actual combat, the traditional combat in Colombia. There is, there is also this level of there's kidnapping, uh, there are disappearances, um, there's a lot of uh, just political cruelty um, to, 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 make a, to make a point. Um, and so you just never know what, what you're going to head into there. One of the big differences uh, between now and then is that back then the governments and the guerrillas certainly it was true in El Salvador, a little less so in Guatemala, uh, and certainly in, in uh, Nicaragua. The governments had a sense, and so did the guerrillas, of public relations. And they knew, as a result of the ABC correspondent being killed in Nicaragua, right. that if you killed an American journalist, there were going to be consequences. Um, and nobody was willing to, to go that far. That's not true in Colombia mm -hmm. anymore. The, the sense of PR, of public relations, of oh, we can't, uh, we can't kill an American journalist because we'll, uh, we'll reap bad headlines around the world. Meaningless. Well, I think Colombia is, is quite different from, from anything we saw in Latin America before. Uh, the, uh, first of all, there is this, uh, ho this huge tradition of violence in Colombia. Colombia had, uh, d during the, the 20th century, two huge civil war, uh, uh, one with 100,000 deaths, the other with... Uh, um, 200 or 300,000 deaths. Uh, some of the, you know, the leader of the FARC, for instance, uh, uh, his nick nickname is Tito Fijo, sure shot. Uh, this guy has been a guerrilla uh, fighter since he was seven years old. I mean, he was in the, in the previous uh, uh, civil war among the, the parties there. So there is this, this huge violence. And then combined with, with this, there is a drug drug trafficking and the huge amount of, of drug money mm -hmm. and, the, and, 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 and also, also crime, organized crime different from the drug, drug traffic. So the combination of this is creating a chaotic situation in, in Colombia and, and you know, the lives of journalists, as you said in the introduction of the program, has, has no value. I mean, uh, well, plus I think in, in with the level of chaos there, you can't, you know, if you're a journalist, an American journalist or a Brazilian journalist, and certainly if you're a Colombian journalist, uh, you, you might be out somewhere in the country. And it, it, it wouldn't be that it's a political decision made by a faction to kill you. It could be, you know, the guy who's at the head of this roadblock because he had a bad day. Yeah. I mean, you, you don't know. It may not be making a political statement at all. It might right. just be your unlucky day. And w what is very pity about journalism in Colombia is that uh, Colombia had a very good journalism. Mm -hmm. You're talking about uh, how these intimidations affect you. I mean, really affected. I mean, if you see investigative journalism, the, the, pr probably the best place in Latin, in, in Latin America a few years ago that had investigative journalism was Colombia. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the first country in, in Latin America that had uh, a, a FOI, I mean, the Freedom of Information Act kind of public uh, information, access to public information was Colombia. But, you know, they start killing, 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 and of, of course they were intimidated. Of course they, they couldn't uh, uh, deal with the level of, of violence that were imposed. They bombed uh, a newsroom. They, they killed dozens of journalists, like you, you said, and, and they keep killing and, and there are lots of journalism, uh, journalists from, from, from Colombia living in the United States or, or, in, or in Europe because they are in the list of death squads and this is no kidding. Thank I mean, you if you are there, they're going to kill right. you. <clears throat> Winston, Winston Churchill once when he was a young reporter before he became a politician said that nothing is so exhilarating for a man as to be shot at without result. <laughs> um, does this does this cause young people to want to go to Colombia from your newspapers? Um, I, I think the answer is not like it was 20 years ago. I mean, 20 years ago in, in El Salvador and in Central America, there were a lot of young reporters who came. They didn't have a job. They didn't have a, 
a promise that anyone in the United States would print what they wrote, but they came anyway because they knew that that there was a conflict here that needed to be covered and they wanted to be a part of that. I don't think that's the case. I don't see that as much in Colombia anymore. Well, I, in El Salvador, I, I, once I was um, in a taxi going to a, barri a barricade. El Salvador is a small country, so it was easy to um, uh, 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 take a cab and say, let's go to the war. And, and that was literally what, 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 what happened. But I was in this, in this, in this cab and the uh, boy in the, in the barricade kind of start uh, shooting because the taxi driver panicked and was, and that was the first time in my life that someone was shooting at me. I tell you, it, it, it's not that, <laughs> that uh, really present. It, I, I mean, of course, they uh, was a, a, a 14 year old boy that afterwards was screaming and, and, and saying bad, bad things because the taxi driver was. But we, I, I, I agree with one, we had that, that uh, um, uh, assurance that they were not killing us is, is, is specific. It, and, and also the young people were going because, uh, um, like, like Karen was saying before the program, it was a sense of, of being witness of, of, of history. You know, it was a revolution. It was a, a you know, a, a, a two sides very well identif identified. What's going on in Colombia is not like, like, like that. You know, it's a mix of things. You have uh, uh, the, the paramilitaries in, on, on the right, uh, uh, the two groups on the left. You, you have all of them make, making money out of drugs. I mean, it's so different from... But yet, but yet fascinating. I mean, Colombia is an endlessly fascinating country. It's a real country with a real history. I mean, that's what drives us all, isn't it? As, this, uh, as a friend of mine said one time, all journalists are driven to some degree by the, by the desire to say to their grandchildren, yeah, I was there. I saw that. <laughs> we, all, uh, we all like the sense of history, I think. Um, if Colombia is the worst situation uh, in Latin America, what's the most hopeful? In, in terms of the media? Yeah. I think there are a lot of hopeful situations there now. I think if you look at, at Peru, for example, I mean, you, you really can credit the Peruvian media with having a big role in, in what's happened the, there over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. the, um, the departure of, of Fujimori, the kind of uncovering of, of the, the really base corruption that existed in, in, in that government. And, the, and they got it started and they followed it through. Were there excesses in the coverage? Yes. Were, you know, was it, did it kind of get out of hand? Yes. Uh, that, all that's true, but I, and I think there was an, an, ex an exhilaration for them after so many years of being completely voiceless and powerless. Um, um, they did it, you know, and they, and he left. I think that's hopeful. I think that um, in, in Brazil certainly has a thriving media, you know, great newspapers, great television. Um, Argentina, Argentines, uh, to my mind, are still a little too tied, you know, a newspaper is tied to a power structure and every power structure has its own voice within the media so that it, it doesn't have, I think, quite the independence that, that some, some places I have. I think what, what fascinates me is the number of countries that have, have never had before freedom of the press and they are kind of experiencing n now, uh, like, for instance, Paraguay. Paraguay has never had a uh, freedom of, uh, of the press. This is a, a totally new notion. I remember being in a, in a press conference in Paraguay and, and asking not tough questions, just normal questions to a minister and, and then a, 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 a girl, a reporter from a local paper asked me, can we really ask this kind of questions? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, she was very sincere in saying, uh, and, uh, and I was recently talking to someone who wanted um, sort of a training workshop in, in um, in Paraguay, and I, I, I asked a publisher of, of the ABC Color, the main newspaper there, what kind of uh, investigative uh, journalism or ethics, what, what is the thing that you, and he said, ask them to ask questions. Uh, 
you know, teach them to ask questions. They don't know how to ask questions. They, they think they, they have been uh, you know, uh, educated in a regime that they was just, just the intermediary to the, you know, the mouthpiece of the government. So they, they don't know how to, to interview. So, yeah. Yeah, but, but, but if you look at Paraguay, it's amazing what they are doing there. And, and, and if you go to countries that we covered in the, in the 80s, I mean, the Central American countries, Honduras, El Salvador, it's, uh, we cannot recognize this, the same newspapers because they were n zero. They were, they were nothing, and now they... I think two countries have to be mentioned. One is Guatemala, where Guatemala has a hidden history of 30 years where there were so many things they couldn't write about. And now that there's been a peace treaty, I think the, the, the journalists have led the way in uncovering the hidden history of Guatemala and what happened during that period from about 54 to 96. Really, you're talking about 40 years. Uh, and the other country is Mexico. The other country is Mexico, where the political system, uh, the old political system is disintegrating, uh, thanks in part to journalism. And now journalists are, are experimenting with their newfound freedom and very successfully. Karen, you mentioned earlier that as an American reporter, you had a certain degree of protection. What about local indigenous reporters? Are they, are they more subject to intimidation, and are they more fearful for their lives? They should be more fearful <laughs> for their lives in places where, where, uh, where do, that, threat, that threat exists. Uh, in, you know, in many places, they're extremely brave, dedicated people. There's no question about that. I think anyone, anybody who has worked as a journalist, as a foreign journalist, not only in Latin America, but really in countries all around the world. Um, those of us who, who go from country to country and have a responsibility for large regions really depend a great deal mm -hmm. on, on local journalists. Uh, many times there are people who can't write what they know and, and want to make sure information gets out. Um, I think that, uh, you know, going back to, to the kind of archetypal military government situation in, in, in a place like, like Argentina was, to, it just wasn't worth it to give an American trouble. Mm -hmm. um, the consequences of it would, would, would just be too, too great. Um, you know, so they could follow you and they could make your life difficult in many ways, but they, but they weren't, you know, they, didn't, they did not disappear American journalists there. Argentine journalists, lots of them. Uh, and to the point where, finally, there were very few Argentine journalists who, were, who made any attempt, really, to write beyond the very tight box that, that they were put in. But I think it is, it is very dangerous. I mean, and we've seen in Colombia. I mean, you know, those 34 journalists you mentioned, they're, they're Colombians, mostly. Right. Let, let's take, a, let's take a, uh, a situation other than Colombia, which I think you all agree is probably a special, uh, special situation, but a country like... Uh, like Argentina or some other um, country that you might name, it. H how do the politicians try to control the press there? It's not, not well, through intimidation, that's, that's but through a, official advertising yeah. and that sort that's, of thing. That's a new phenomenon. Uh, on, the, on one hand, you see that the, with the neoliberalism, etc., the state is, is kind of shrinking and, and big corporations are growing. I mean, they are privatizing everything, etc. So. The, the intimidation is still there, but, but take uh, uh, other forms. I mean, still, uh, I mean, there is a freedom of the press. There is elected government, not necessarily democracy, but elected government all over. Uh, so, you know, the, the intimidations now come uh, through new pieces of legi legislation that, that are, are aiming. In my country, in Brazil, there, there are, uh, I, I don't know the figure now, but just a few months ago, there were about 50 five uh, projects of laws, uh, bills in, 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 in Congress that were totally against the, the some, somehow against, against the notion of, of the freedom of the, of the uh, press. Then you have the fiscal terror, which is another f way that in democracy or, or in so-called democracy, they are using against news, news newspaper. I mean, if your newspaper is, is bothering my administration, I send the IRS there. Uh, and you know, the IRS, uh, 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 you, you know, the, the, the tax people, equivalent yeah. to the IRS and, right. and, and go there and do a very, uh, uh, very tough auditing. This is, I mean, I know what, what is more intimidating than, than having, because they, if they want, they're going to find lots of things.
in Peru, uh, President Fujimori, there was one television station mm -hmm. that was always after him and w reporting, uh, doing some very good reports. First of all, they, they took away the license uh, of the TV state. They took it away from the owner, who was a man named Baruch Ibcher. And the second thing they did, they then withdrew his citizenship. They, they announced that he was no longer a Peruvian citizen. That's pretty and what happens in Latin America when you are no longer a citizen, you go to Miami. So he came to Miami. <laughs> and he continued fighting from there to get his station back. And I was not convinced that Fujimori was really gone and that his old apparatus had been destroyed until Evcher earlier this year went back to Peru and reclaimed his TV station. That's the sort of thing they can do. They, there's a long tradition of, um, of governments and government agencies placing advertising and controlling advertising for papers, a, a spigot that can be turned on and, and off. Well, in Mexico, they had this other little thing they used to do. The Mexican government subsidized the price of newsprint uh, so that newsprint was very cheap, and uh, this was terrific for the owner of the newspaper. Mm -hmm. But they could come to you one day if you'd been too critical and say, oh, gee, your quota of newsprint uh, got lost somewhere, mm -hmm. so you don't have it. Hmm. Yeah, and, and, and the funny thing is that in 1993, when they, they stopped that, uh, was Salinas, I think, uh, stopped that, uh, and, and everybody, I mean, everybody outside international organizations for the freedom of the, of the press applauded that as a good, uh, as a good move. Uh, many publishers in Mexico were, was, uh, were against it, say, no, no, we need the subsidies. I mean, uh, I was making money out of this, and I was well be be behaved, so I, I, I had no problem with, with the government. There's a, there's a long tradition, too, in some countries uh, in Latin America of actually paying reporters for good Oh, yeah, government. Mexico was the biggest example of, of, the, How did of that. that work? How did it, that work? It's interesting. It was part of the culture. It's not that the journalist was feeling that they were doing anything wrong. Uh, if a journalist was covering a bit, like a ministry, for instance, mm -hmm. they had this small salary from the newspaper, and then they had a big envelope with money from the minister of that, that bit. So, you know, that, that was obviously a way to... But I found uh, in, in workshops and things very, uh, uh, you know, many journalists that I had to kind of explain why it was wrong to receive money from, mm -hmm. from the source you're, you're covering. Uh, so, the, so the ministry would actually pay the reporter? Yeah, I mean, if I, a, a reporter was, was kind of traveling with uh, the president of Mexico in Europe, Right. Uh, they would ha receive an envelope with, with money for the expenses during the thing. Uh, there is a, a, a reporter that uh, um, told me that in one visit to uh, Germany, they, they said to, to, to him, don't, don't bother to write the story. Here, here's the, uh, an envelope with your money. Go to shopping, and, and we can send for you the story. <laughs> Just very quickly, when I moved to Mexico as a foreign correspondent, the first Christmas I was there, somebody rang the buzzer outside, and I went, and there's a huge basket of candy and liquor. And I mean lots of liquor. I mean 24 bottles of champagne and this and that. And I said, uh, what is this? And they said, from the president. The man turned around and walked away. And I said, I, you know, I called the head of the foreign press club, and I said, what do I do? I can't accept this. He said, if you hadn't accepted it, that man who delivered it would be in trouble. He'd be in big trouble yeah. because you have to accept it. He said, the only thing you can do is you can go to the Mexican president's office and you can ask whether the first lady has any favorite charities and then you can give a check to that charity. He said, but, but you have to accept this. this I, I should say for our students gathered here in the studio and for the audience as well is that this is, this is roughly akin to uh, the White House press secretary walking through the press room on Friday afternoons and, and passing out envelopes to uh, the yeah. reporters. The point, it's just the as point, I mean, to be fair, the point is that we are talking about the past. This is, is changing in Mexico. Mm -hmm. It has changed a lot. You don't see these kind of things. Uh, maybe in some parts of Mexico where the, the reforms are, uh, are coming slow, this kind of a wave, right? But, um, but the, the news is a good news. That this is the past. The, it is changing. One little part of that. The Mexican foreign ministry did not pay reporters who covered the foreign mm -hmm. ministry, the equivalent of our State Department. Uh, so nobody wanted to cover the foreign ministry, <laughs> except, except that what they would do, if you covered the foreign ministry and they thought you were a presentable person and intelligent, you would be 
allowed to become a member of the Foreign Service. <laughs> Ah, so you could actually <laughs> so, work for them. So you them. could actually and work and for them and go abroad as a diplomat. Is it still possible to buy a buy good coverage in Latin America? Oh yeah, I think so. I think I, I think the changes are not, you know, changes don't don't uh, come in not a, revolutionary. Yeah, right? you know, it's a, it, it's a still. I mean, we we live in a schizophrenic duo world because we are kind of. Uh, modernized uh, and and we are open societies opening very you, what what we have to understand is that the co the, the the legislation there all the 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 thing that came from 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 colonial times see the state as the uh, as the uh, as the center the authority must must be respected so there is a cultural thing that that is very hard hard to the change and of course there are some big uh, corporations now that uh, that can influence the, the 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 media companies with 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 money and and I'm 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 sure I don't I don't know specific specific cases but I I tend to believe that this is happening. How do the politicians feel about this? We have a we have a newly democratizing um, ethos in that part of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, more and more governments are becoming. Um, more or less democratic. Um, the press is becoming somewhat freer. How do the politicians feel about this? Well, you know, there, there are still laws in a number of these countries that are, uh, I don't know what you would call them, any kind of anti-defamation laws, right. that it is against the law to disrespect right. the president or the, laws. yeah. Um, and, and those do still exist. Uh, again, there's a case in Argentina right now where uh, a magazine there uh, a couple of years ago wrote a c big cover story about then President Minim. I can't remember if he was actually still president then or not, but he, it was well known that he uh, he had he had a very public was kind of like Rudy Giuliani. He had a very public disagreement with his wife. Uh, it was well known that he had a friend who was a uh, former Miss Universe from Chile who he subsequently married. But they put President Menem and his friend on the cover of the magazine and and they were sued uh, and this has been in court in Argentina for two years now uh, even though uh, in the last year I believe they have actually repealed the laws but the, the legislature has repealed the law but the court system refuses to allow them to drop the case and so these things they are changing uh, but they haven't quite changed all the way yet it's funny because the, uh, the politicians are the same. I mean, they were in the in in the opposition before, and they were talking mm -hmm. to us very, you know, in, in very good mood and and helping the fight for the uh, freedom of the press. There was their 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 cause also. And then you know they 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 became government, and when they are there, you know, they change com completely the view of 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 the value of the press, and they have a, uh, in, in a hard time to understand the role of, of the press in a, in a democratic so society. But about Argentina that, that uh, uh, Karen was talking, um, w one of the things, one of the new phenomena of, of, of journalism in Latin America is the use of uh, in international forums, in international courts to deal with the the freedom of the press cases that that uh, you cannot deal with uh, be, because of the national legis legislation. So, using for in, for instance, a a uh, journalist from Argentina used the 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 Inter-American Court of of Human Rights uh, to actually change the law in Argentina. This disacato law and other law laws that they are changing is be is because he 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 he. He sued in in the Inter-American Court of, of Human Rights, the Republic of Argentina, the state, and and uh, there was a a, a out-of-court settlement, and and uh, as as part of the settlement was the changing of of the law. Mm -hmm. When in Peru they tried to do the same, Fujimori had another idea. He just left the Inter-American system. He said, "Oh, oh, for." Giving back the television station, I, 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 I renounced the 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 agreement. In in America, <clears throat> for example, it is very hard to libel a politician. Uh, our our laws and court decisions. Uh, there's a great precedent that you can say almost anything about a public figure uh, in America. But the disrespect law in many countries in Latin America 
prevents that, right? That's correct. Well, from depending from country to country. Right. In Chile, you have, uh, there was a woman, Alejandra Matus, who wrote uh, a book called The Black Book of Chilean Justice, in which she specifically wrote about the, the court system in Chile and how the courts were not really impartial and unfair. Well, there was an arrest. I mean, her publisher was arrested. There was an arrest warrant out for her. And she went to Miami, Miami. of course. Right. And she sued. Uh, she sued uh, the government through the Inter-American Court now, System. Yeah. And I think that case is still going on. But she, uh, she still can't go back to Chile today. Look, there, there are some, some hopeful signs. Uh, Paraguay, uh, for example, has, uh, I think, recently rescinded a law which made it very difficult for, for, re for journalists just to check public records and yeah. to get public information like that. Yeah, but one thing that you have to un understand is that we have all the laws you can imagine. I mean, our Napoleonic code-based law system is, is based in that you, we have to have, I mean, the, f the fact that we are approving this, these laws uh, doesn't mean that we're going to uh, obey them, basically. So, you know, one thing is the, w what are uh, in, the, in the books, and, and the other thing is the, is, is the practice. And I think one of the main problems now is the justice. I mean, if you mm -hmm. ask me what can we do for Latin, Latin America journalism, I keep saying uh, foundations and international orga organization, we have now to stop uh, talking to journalists and start talking to, to judges and, and explain to judges that don't un un understand the role of, of the press in, uh, in a democratic society because they are censoring. Judges in Latin, in Latin America are becoming the new wave of censors. And that's, uh, that's uh, uh, totally absurd under our own cons constitutions, but it's that, that's what is going on. But I, th I think it's also important to, to, to note that journalism in, in Latin America certainly in South America, takes its model not from, not from American journalism mm -hmm. but from European journalism. Right. And European journalism mm -hmm. is, is, is politically affiliated journalism by and large. You, you, you report from the point of view of, of the whatever political line you, you follow. Now, I, I, I would be the first to acknowledge that in the United States, uh, you know, objectivity is a subjective notion uh, and that that when we go around and saying oh we're completely objective and we don't hew to any political party that that's not you know we can all find holes in that but but at least there is an ideal out there we don't set out to be that way and and we criticize ourselves and each other when we fail to mm -hmm. to to reach that standard as we so often do I think that the the politics in Latin America are starting to move toward the American model as as the ideal at least but journalism is kinda is still lagging behind a bit one of the ironies in all of this especially with what Rosenthal was saying is that the reason journalists get in trouble and get killed or intimidated or exiled in their countries is because they are doing the jobs that judges and prosecutors don't do because the institutions of mm -hmm. democracy mm -hmm. are so weak. Mm -hmm. So when there's a scandal and the, the prosecution is not dealing with it, uh, the judges, the courts don't deal with it, journalism deals with it. And that's where they get in trouble. And, 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 it's, it, and it's all to their credit, of course. And actually what, what, what happens, this is, is very true, uh, what, what, what happens is that uh, the other demo, the, the democratic institutions don't uh, uh, evolve in the same pace of journalism. So journalism is a kind of a, a vanguard in this, uh, in, in this demo democratization, democratization process. And journalists are so enthusiastic about, about getting results and, and that, that they accept this, uh, that, that Juan is mentioning, that this role of, of investigators, of police, of, of prosecutors, mm -hmm. and, uh, and this uh, gathers a lot of pop, pop, pop popularity but this is is uh, is not a permanent effect be, because we are not so, so supposed to be police to be judges to judge people so then there is a backlash you know uh, uh, you you can see the polls that uh, journalism prestige goes goes up and then there is some exa ex exaggeration of this phenomenon of that mm -hmm. journalist uh, journalist has to be in opposition 
always and, and has to denounce wrong, wrongdoing always. And then there is a backlash, and, and in, in some countries that's what's, what's going on. Is there, a, is there a hero in all of this, a Martin Luther King of journalism in, in Latin America? <laughs> Well, it's very hard to uh, point out someone. There are lots of, of, of heroes. Uh, I mean, one of my favorites is re receiving this week a CPJ, a Committee to Protect Journalists Prize, uh, Horacio Ver Verbitsky from Argentina. Be uh, and, and the reason I'm um, mentioning him is because he was one of the pioneers to use this uh, inter-American system to fight against Carlos Menin's administration and, uh, and, and the state of Argentina, and he won and he, he changed laws. And, but there are other people uh, all over uh, Lat Lat Latin America that are understanding and fighting for the freedom of the press. One person that should be mentioned, I think, here is the uh, Colombian writer, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, mm -hmm. who has spent a lot of his money and a lot of effort to create schools or institutions, uh, fellowships, to try to educate journalists. Right. How do the people in countries in Latin America that you visit, how do they feel about this issue? Are they, are they aware that they have a press that is not completely free, that is um, subject to all these pressures that you're talking about? And how do they feel about it? I think to, to some extent the, the, the serious press um, uh, because of the level of development and the level of education in the country is is only speaking to a relatively narrow range of of people um, um, and that you know some of that you, it just has to do with with literacy but uh, so so that you you wouldn't have sort of massive response but when something gets started something and this is the difference between between visual media and and printed media you look at at peru you look at what happened when they started showing those videos on tv mm -hmm. of montesinos um just like that you know this guy who had been completely untouchable um you know the yeah, epitome of, uh, is, uh, he is he was the head of uh, the de facto head of the Secret Service under President mm. Fujimori, and, and in the view of a lot of people, he really did run the country. He also had a very good relationship with, with the CIA and, and, and with the with And the television the, showed him. He, uh, the, he was, it was always believed that he bribed, um, that he bribed politicians. Um, and uh, in fact, he was so full of himself that it turned out he had taped virtually every crime he'd ever committed on videotape. And when these were, were leaked, an initial batch of them was leaked, and they were broadcast on television. I mean, it was, it was the beginning of the end right. for, for but, uh, but, but then several media exec executives were kind of also uh, because bad Because they fellows. were on the tapes, too. Yeah. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> what, what problems do your reporters find uh, today when they, when they go into Latin America? What do, you, what do you tell a young reporter who's going into Latin America for the for the first time. For the very first time, well, they're likely to go to uh, to some of the more